Ronnie Darling, former Met, now working for a TBS TNT with the playoffs. He had the Dodgers match last night, and he joins us now. Uh, Ron, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Uh, how surprised were you, the outcome last night? You know, you get less surprised. Um, and I'm not talking about the Mets game, but you get less surprised as you get a little deeper into these division series because you get into the third or fourth starter. So I think that's one of the reasons that with all the games, you had 61 runs scored in those four games. But as far as the Mets game is concerned, um, I was I was pretty surprised, not that the Mets got to Brett Anderson because their lineup against lefties has been great uh, since Cespedes joined them, but um, I was surprised Harvey didn't have uh, a, a little bigger game uh, considering the circumstances. He's usually a, a big game kind of guy. The atmosphere that you had with that game, and I know that Mets fans have been waiting a long time for this, but you brought up something great that you get through that first inning and it's about emotion and adrenaline. And then all of a sudden you get to the second inning and it's as if somebody let the air out of you. Did, did Harvey, and I, I thought Harvey would have a great game. Like he'd rise yeah. to the occasion, but he sort of got out there in that second inning. You go, Oh, now I have to pitch using all of my talents here. Not just this emotion in the building. Yeah. I think what happens, Dan, a lot is that, you know, sports, you go out there sometimes and you feel like you can dunk or you can throw the ball a hundred miles an hour. And then what happens is that, um, you know, you, you take that mindset out in the second inning, but you don't have that adrenaline to go with it. So now you have to think about, okay, okay, wait a minute, slow down. How do I just relax and start executing and keeping the ball down and using all my pitches and all of those things that you talked about. And I think that, what, what happens for a lot of pitchers, because I've been there and I've been there in that second inning feeling literally like I had just run a marathon and didn't know how I could like walk to the table to get a, a glass of water, it, is that you got to just play mind games with yourself and just say, hey, wait a minute. You don't feel as bad as you feel. You feel better than that. So just uh, kind of get through your uh, through this next inning. And, and usually – it's, uh, uh, you know, three, if you've gone through one through four, you're getting towards the end of the uh, lineup. So usually that helps you too. You and Cal nearly jumped out of your seats to start the game when you thought that both sides, both benches were being warned. And then we realized it was just the instant replay phone. So there was a sense of, okay, now we can have just a normal atmosphere here instead of putting these guys on alert. That don't throw inside because if you do, I'm going to run you. Yeah, you know, and in fact, I, I apologize for that later. Um, sometimes in the booth, Dan, you get so excited, just like you used to as a player, and you, you're just so uh, um, trying to be so astute about what's going on, and I just totally misread the entire situation. But I'm glad that they didn't start it with the warning, um, and it's another reason to, to hate the instant replay. Not even the phones can work <laughs> now. But, hey, um, I'm right there with you. I thought the same thing. <laughs> So when I saw it, and but but Mattingly was out there and Collins wasn't. So that's when I yeah, thought, okay, yeah. and you guys correctly pointed that out, but I thought, oh, God, they're going to warn him here, and that's going to preclude these guys from throwing inside. Yeah, and I, and I thought that it was just going to be – it's a very difficult way for a pitcher to start a game by being told you're not going to be able to do it. But, but it wasn't that. Um, uh, I think that was a great decision by the umpires in Major League Baseball – I'll let him play, and nothing happened other than the crowd uh, wanting Nutley uh, by the end of the game, which I, uh, <laughs> I, I've never heard before at a ballpark. Uh, Clayton Kershaw, short rest in New York, and trying to figure out you know, why he is who he is in the postseason yeah. and not the regular season. Can you, can you put your finger on what is different about him or the approach to him? Uh, you know, it's it's... The only thing I could I put my finger on, Dan, is that I, I think this kid is such a great kid. And I'm not talking about on the field because we all know his numbers. I'm talking about off the field, as a human being, as a husband, all those kind of things produces a human being who really, really cares. And when you really care, you're out there knowing the responsibility that you have for your team. And sometimes that could take you out of whatever element you're in. And what I mean by that is that you start to shoulder too much of the burden. He can only do what he does. He can only do what he's always done. And that is during the regular season, 
no one hits him. Now, that being said, um, the numbers uh, usually, I always say, don't lie, okay? Mm-hmm. In elimination games, he's 0-2 with a 9 ERA. Um, you can go on and on. You know, he's lost his last four postseason games. All that being said, and it's against everything that I would usually believe in, I believe in Clayton Kershaw. At some point, he's got to have one of those games that the people in Los Angeles are going to go, you know, that's his signature game. From now on, he is going to be that pitcher. Not only that he is in the uh, regular season, but in the postseason. And that could be tonight because, um, you know, the last time he was on the city field mound, he threw a shutout. I know it wasn't the same team. It was before Cespedes got there. It's going to be a bigger deal. But anyone who watched that first game and saw him pitch, okay, it says three runs at the end of the day, but the reliever who came in gave up the single to right. Mm -hmm. Um, When he was in there, he only gave up a run. He struck out 11. He was this close to being where you you just don't get to him. So uh, that's got to give him a lot of confidence. And I think, honestly, if I – if I were talking to him, I'd say, hey, listen, this is not on, all on you. You just go do your thing, bro, and we'll, and, and we'll get enough runs. And, uh, and if he does that, maybe he'll have one of those games. Are these uh, numbers, uh, the uh, miles per hour, the jugs gun, radar, are they, are they accurate? I mean, Syndergaard was bringing cheese the whole night, but I, I, I wonder what Doc Gooden would throw on today's guns. Well, uh, today's guns are, are, are not right. You know, they're a different kind of gun than they were in our day. I shouldn't say they're not right. They're a different gun than they used to use in, in, in our day. Nolan Ryan would yeah. not hit 100 on the guns that we uh, uh, used in those days. So, I mean, no one threw harder than Nolan Ryan. Frank Tanana, in, in his best day, would never hit 100. Dwight Gooden used to hit 94, 95. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, compared to some of the guys that play today. So, um, you know, Dwight would routinely be 99, 100. The difference, I think, Dan, is that Dwight would not throw 100. He would throw 97, 96, uh, an accurate where he wanted to throw it, and he wouldn't max out. It was this beautiful, fluid mo- um, a movement. But I think what you have today, and it's not the kid's fault, when you have these crazy parents who have these uh, these ray guns and these uh, uh, speed guns at uh, 14 or 15 year old practices, it's only human when you're a young kid and you look up and after the game you go, uh, you know, pops or coach, you know, what did I hit today? Well, you, you know, you struggled. You only hit 79 today. You better come out throwing a little harder the next time. I mean, those are the kind of things that happen for these kids. So by the time they get to this level. Uh, they've only known one thing, and that is to break the radar gun every night they go out there, and that's why they throw so hard. Yeah, I'm watching Cindergarten, and, and granted, your changeup's 90, but I want to know what you do with that 90. Uh, you can have 100, but you better have something else, and, and Gooden mm-hmm. had such a great curveball. Nolan Ryan yeah. had a great changeup and curveball. Yeah. That's the difference I see with these guys, Ronnie, is mm-hmm. that, that second and third pitch had better be a money pitch as well because they'll eventually dial up to that 100-mile-an-hour fastball. I don't know how they do it uh, because I never could hit, but uh, I'll tell you, they, they do. They dial it up. And I think the thing that saves them, Dan, is that at some point you had to have three or four pitches because you were out there for two and a half hours. You're out there for nine innings. Uh, the difference now is that you have these young, talented guys that have been taught to go at a frenetic pace for two hours. And if that's six innings, if that's six and two-thirds, so be it. But that's what they're doing. Uh, They're not going out there to start the race and finish the race. They're starting out there to run as fast as they can, as hard as they can, as long as they can. And um, that's the difference, I think, between a starting pitcher, uh, you know, in yesteryear than it is now. Uh, The talent, um, you know, you can't tell me the talent is not there for a guy to pitch complete games and do all the things that guys did 30 years ago. Um, The guys are in better shape. They're taller and stronger and all that stuff. It's just the way they've been taught. We'll be watching tonight. Uh, tell Cal we said hello and Ernie as well. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you. That's uh, Ron Darling, former Met pitcher, on the call for the NLDS. That's tonight with uh, Ernie Johnson, Cal Ripken Jr. Game four, 8 Eastern, TBS, the exclusive home of the 2015 National League postseason.